stuff happens after you finish the film. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming out on this rainy night. Is there a microphone? Or a... Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you for coming out on this rainy night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, that works really well. Thank you. Hi, I have a little bit of Angelica in the room. So, I was, uh, I just flew in from Michigan, so, um, thank you for being here amongst the first people to, to see this film, I really appreciate it, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, so, um, I'll take any questions you have, and, uh, um, answer anything, or listen to anything you have to say, I'd be happy to do that, so, would like to go first. Can you see me? How do I look? <laughs> Uh, you said in the film you've never met anybody who gets four weeks of vacation. Uh, just want to say I get five. And I work for Rupert Murdoch. So, not showing off or anything, I just wanted to make sure you, you finally met somebody. Well, thank you. How much do you make each year? Uh, about 160000 160000 Typical middle-class American. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most, <laughs> most people that you earn your wage group do... Um, have very good vacation packages. Yeah. Yes, you know that. Um, but if you work at Walmart or Taco Bell, or if you work in General Motors in Flint now, where new hires are making ten to twelve dollars an hour or whatever, uh, those days are gone. And uh, you know, out in the real world, where you know where people live. This, you see the story this month that this is middle class for the first time is no longer the majority of the country. You know, so you have people that make over 150,000 or 200,000 a year. And they're a nice group of people, and then you have everybody else down here struggling and living from paycheck to paycheck. Majority of Americans also, um, I don't know if you saw this last week, that if, if they needed $400 in an emergency, um, there is no way that they have it. They'd have to actually try to get a loan or borrow it from somebody. But the majority of Americans, if they needed 400 bucks, don't have it. That's not the country I want to live in. So, and I'm not going anywhere, so and that has to change. Um, Anyways, um, okay, we've established one lie in the film. We've got the next <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, I thought it was wonderful, and I'm an alien, so there's where are you, that. Where are you from? I'm from Australia. What are you doing here? <laughs> Somebody check the papers. <laughs> um, yeah, your, your dollar's worth more than mine now. Um, has anyone in the Pentagon seen the film? Uh, no, but we did have a wonderful congressional screening a couple weeks ago where a bunch of members of Congress and our staff came uh, and we showed it right in the Capitol building. Uh, that, was a, that was a very, very good evening. I was very happy about that. So, no, not to my knowledge, nobody has seen it in Pentagon because it only has been in film festivals and you and Lincoln Plaza and the Arc Light in Hollywood. So it'll be everywhere on February 12th. This is just like a sneak preview run that they are doing to, because for Oscar qualification purposes, they right? have to run for a week in New York and LA. And we've, already, we've already been voted, voted onto the shortlist for uh, Best Documentary at the Oscars. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's nice of you to say that. I'm sorry about this microphone. Um, if I stood over here, it might be better. Um, okay, mm. who's got the next one? Just go ahead and shout because I can't see you. Or you, or you got a microphone. Hello there. Yeah. Um, just as an aside, I think most people that work like for Rupert Murdoch don't have a grievance procedure and are employees at will. But in any event, I was wondering with the choices you had to make here, how did you hone in on those particular countries when there are many to choose from in Western Europe and other places? It was pretty random. I just, uh, you know, from my own travels, I, I hear and see things I think are funny and strange and I wonder why we don't have them. A lot of it too was just we just went to countries to see what we'd find and and you know we didn't know we'd find certain things. Those, those are even better. I mean when they're telling me their honeymoon is paid for, I don't know that. I'm, I'm hearing it for the first time you're hearing it. 
So the what the fuck look on my face. I said fuck. People at Ron Angelica. <laughs> Born again Christians. Uh, so the way I make my movies is I have a very, very sketchy, rough outline, and then I make sure the field producers don't tell me a whole lot. I kind of know why we're there, but it's, it's better if I learn it and you see my reaction in you know, what it really is as opposed to me acting. What? They pay for your honeymoon? You know, it's like, I, ever, I don't like those documentaries. I, you know, I think you can see it, and it's fake, and, and not interesting. I think it's more interesting to see me gobsmacked by a lot of the stuff I'm running into. So. <laughs> Subway. 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 <laughs> People are, are running out of room. <laughs> Hi, um, you mentioned some extraordinary events around the world that were positive in nature. What caused the wheels to come off here? What extraordinary events have you seen during your lifetime that have led us to be in a position where you have to make a film like this? Well, I think modern day capitalism uh, sort of run amok has caused a lot of what our problems are in terms of, and then mash that up with our inherent racism, you know, and mash that up with um, the sort of me mentality as opposed to the we mentality. And you get kind of an ugly situation here. Um, so, you know, we live in a country where you got your problems, I got my problems. You know, I'll take care of mine, you take care of yours. It's not the way that people think in other countries. And it's not because they're better than us, they're not. Uh, they just realize for their own self-interest in a large, to a large extent, it's better to have a society where you have as few cracks as possible for people to fall through. Because they don't want the outcome of that. They don't want the result of too many people being without or having to struggle or living with fear and anxiety. You live with a lot of fear, you buy guns. It's, it's kind of all connected, you know. There's, um, you know, you become afraid that someone's going to take what you have. Um, it, it just doesn't work that way elsewhere, and they don't want it to work that way. That's why even conservatives in these countries support universal health care. They don't want you to struggle if you get sick. They don't want to put those things on you that are just going to wind you tighter and tighter and tighter until, you know, a certain number of people blow. So, and I think they also believe that if you let women into the room, uh, things are going to get better. And it's, it's an odd concept that we have here, that we don't believe that, which, I, which I've never understood because, I mean, I just say this to the guys, <laughs> we like women, whether you're heterosexual or homosexual, but we, we like women, so... Why are they not at the table? Why are they not in the room? Why are we happy that 20% of our U.S. Senator women are women? There's nothing to be happy about that. That is a sick number. 51, 52% of the population, 20% of the power. You know, it's, it's a form of apartheid. It's, a, it's, a, it's where the, the minority, that would be the male gender, is you know, making the laws and calling the shots and telling the majority what they have to do and how, you know, I asked the Muslim guy there, what he asked, does he make his wife cover her head? And of course he says yes. And I, you know, I, and I think, and I left that in there because I think it's, I think it's good to show that, I mean, that people are complicated. And he's willing to admit he's a dick at home. <laughs> but um, he doesn't believe he has a right to impose his dickishness on the rest of the population. It's kind of cool, right? I mean, what if what if our you know religious people had that you know attitude? Um, you know, what if our Catholic Church didn't take the position it's taken over the years, whether it be on abortion or condoms or whatever? Who are these people that even have the right to take that position, considering that they covered up thousands and thousands of crimes of of children being raped, you know. So some things just I don't know, I don't get. And I say that as someone who was raised Catholic and went to the seminary uh, as a teenager to be a priest. So, you know, 
I'm just, I'm doubly, triply angry. And I don't like that movie Spotlight either. Because um, to me, it wasn't really about the Catholic Church in Boston. It was about the Boston Globe. And the Boston Globe sat on that story for a decade. So how many thousands of kids were raped? Because the media didn't do its job. The media was afraid to go after the Archdiocese of Boston. You know, the priests who do this are sick. Boston Globe isn't sick. Boston Globe is afraid of the advertisers, people, you know, canceling their subscriptions, or being enablers, uh, because they're Catholic themselves. And it wasn't until the New York Times bought the Globe and sent somebody from here, there, you understand the code for that, right? Um, that, you know, he insisted that they, that they do their job. Well, And that guy was the real hero of the story. Yeah. You know, but... I mean, I was at the Toronto Film Festival and I watched all these Boston Globe reporters that are portrayed in the movie come out on the stage and take a bow and thinking, no, <laughs> you don't get to take a bow for doing what you should have done in the first place. And you purposely covered up the story for 10 years. Why are we talking about Spotlight? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Priests get four weeks paid vacation. <laughs>